You had the self-awareness to identify the wounds that the Lord had healed you from mm -hmm. and the wounds that you were still working through. Right. And to have a very honest conversation with him about, hey, this is this is not just what I know I've gone through, but I know how this shows up right. in my love. Right. I know how this shows up in my friendships and yeah. relationships. Yeah. And this is how it might bleed into or spill into yeah. our romantic. Right, right. Can you talk a little bit? To, it was that the four years of singleness that helped you get to that? Like, how did yeah. you get to a place in your singleness where you were that intentional? Yeah. What is up, everyone? We are back with another episode of Shaping the Culture. Now, like, let's just get to it. The whole sa secular sacred divide. There is no distinction in, in the scriptures. Some of us have trust issues with some of us yeah it's like does god really got us you can't engage the culture with the gospel that first has not engaged you like you know how people are like oh that's just who i am no no <laughs> What is up, everyone? We are back with another episode of Shaping the Culture Podcast. I hope all is well with you all, family. Listen, we've got a very important conversation, a conversation I've been looking forward to for a while. Uh, we don't just have a guest with us. She's a teacher, preacher, writer, pastor, a good friend, expositor of the gospel. <laughs> conversationalist uh a1 day one none other than pastor christina humphrey what's good fam how you hey, doing good good it's good to be here <laughs> you sound a little Ooh, nervous that introduction was you a little sound... heavy there good, <laughs> but good. it's good to be back again man yeah, love yeah. being here i don't know if you're a guest at this point not a, no, you're not just really. like family just, hanging out yeah, just yeah. hanging out talking having a good old time like always like always for those like who don't always. know your parazim church is auntie yes that's yeah. right and so we need another nickname for you here on shaping the culture we're gonna come up with one well, i'm well, sure by maybe the end, by the end of this episode by the end of this episode we definitely will let us know in the comment section what her nickname <laughs> should be <laughs> no this is awesome we're in yeah. your city we're in the dmv that's right it's good to be here it's yeah. always humid but um, pretty disgusting yeah. yeah and you got a jacket on yeah. too. yeah you know because we just don't know if it's gonna be humid <laughs> chilly yeah. hot warm cold so you just living just, by faith every day. Just, yeah, we just said, you know what? Today we're just gonna do the jacket and see where that takes us. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Well, nonetheless, we're glad that you're on the podcast. It's good to be here. I'm excited about the conversation we're gonna have today. Um, it's something that we don't hear about enough, mm -hmm. and I feel like before we jump into it, um, I think it's very important to get a backstory yeah. of you because that's probably going to set up the context for the conversation right. um, because you have a unique story and a unique journey right. and that serves as um, the platform for the conversation today. Right. And so for those who are living under the rock and <laughs> don't know who you are and uh, don't have context for who's sitting right next to me, give us a backstory a little yeah. bit. Let us know who Christina is. Right. So... I was born and raised in Athens, Greece. Um, my mother is Ethiopian, my father's Italian, yeah. and uh, I was born and raised in Athens, Greece, lived there for about 11 years. Yeah. And at the age of 11, my mother and I moved to Canada to join the rest of our family who at the time was living there. Okay. And uh, we moved there at the age of 11. At 13, I really just kind of had my very, very first encounter with the Lord. Yeah. Uh, that's when I, I can say I officially got saved. That's yeah. when I knew I went from being a sinner to being <laughs> saved. I knew. I prayed that sinner's prayer for the first time at 13, but also something really special happened at that time. Yeah. Um, I had my very first encounter with the Lord at 13, that same summer that I got saved that really changed the trajectory of my life. Yeah. Um, I experienced for the first time what receiving a prophetic word from the Lord was. Uh. Um, not like the ratchet kind that we like see today, but like the real authentic prophetic <laughs> yeah. words. Back that, in the good old days. The one that's like coded in like the power of <laughs> God aligned with scripture. Yeah. I love how okay. you have to like clarify, clarify just, that. Because you know, because today you just have to. You just um, never know. But yeah, so I had um, I had that prophetic experience for the first time in my life yeah. and um, experienced with it the power of God for the very first time yeah. in my life. A yeah. lot of things happened for the first time in a very short window of time. And um, during that time that I had that encounter with the Lord, God really revealed that I was called into ministry. Mm. And at 13, you know, your mind doesn't really process a lot of what that really means. Yeah. You just know that, okay, I must, you know, maybe God likes me and that's, yeah. that's great, that's nice. Yeah. But then you start really unpacking the depth of what's spoken over your life. And yeah. for me, 
after I received that word and I started unpacking it, I realized how big and heavy it was. Mm. And so for a while, it set me on this path of just really out of fear, running away from God. Yeah. Um, Lord, you called me into ministry. And it wasn't just, I've called you into ministry. It was, you know, I've set you apart to do X, Y, and Z. And it was a very detailed word that was spoken over my life. It, it spoke details of a ministry that would start in my life later on in, in later on into my adult adulthood that wouldn't be in my home country, but that it would be in a foreign land. Like there was just yeah. a lot of very detailed words that were spoken. Right. And I just remember sitting back after I received that and just being like, well, wait a minute. I don't remember asking the Lord. That's what I wanted to do. Mm. And it almost feels like God is making a decision about my future without really consulting with Sheesh. me. And so as a 13-year-old girl, not really having had at that time proper spiritual guidance around me, you know, there wasn't such thing as a youth ministry, youth pastor, all right, that stuff. Right. And not having that, uh, not having access to someone who was able to come alongside of me and say, hey, look, receiving a prophetic word actually means this. This is yeah. what God is trying to do in your life. Not having that explanation and kind of leaving me to my own to figure it out. Yeah led me to the decision that I just needed to run away as far away from the Lord as possible. Yeah, yeah. And I figured if I could just run as far away from the Lord, then the chances of that prophetic word coming to life are probably slim to none. Hmm. And so from 13 to about 20, 21, I went down a path okay, of just, Jonah. Ooh, I ran, <laughs> yeah, yeah. ran really far, yeah, really fast. Yeah, in the opposite direction. Opposite, complete opposite direction. <laughs> yeah. I pursued everything that was the exact opposite of what God said was going to happen. Wow. And it's so interesting. My, my rebellion was never an outward rebellion. It wasn't, mm -hmm. I'm going to go out and, you know, I'm going to get involved in things that are crazy and, you know, go out and, I don't know, just live in promiscuous life and be drunk. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't that type of outward rebellion. It yeah. was a rebellion of the heart. Yeah. And on the outside, the wow. facade was that I was still good with God, but okay. on the inside, there was no relationship wow. there. And so I started pursuing a path in education, in social relationships, even in a personal relationship. I just started pursuing everything that I knew God would not be involved in. Yeah. Because I just, I was terrified of what was spoken over me at 13. Right, right. And the Lord, in his gracious ways, allowed me to run far. He allowed me to run fast. Yeah. And he allowed me to experience everything I was pursuing. I, I got into, um, you know, I mean, I pursued a completely different path of education, was trying to get into law school, was trying to do a bunch of different things. And the Lord kind of like let me have that. Yeah. And I was excelling in those spaces. I mean, yeah. I was excelling in my studies. Um, at 20, I, I was working at a law firm in wow. the city that I was in at that time that was a pretty prestigious law. Like, I mean, it, yeah. doors were opening for me yeah. in that regard. And God was allowing me to experience everything I wanted to. But then over time, I started experiencing a lack of joy in my life. Mm. And I just started feeling miserable and I couldn't figure out why. Yeah. And I, on, you know, on paper and the outside, life was good. Work was good. Success was there, was being experienced. But that success and um, fulfillment of the soul was lo like mm. just not there. It was lost or yeah. just lacking. And um, I'll never forget it. My mother, who is a really strong woman of prayer, who I really truly believe today that I'm a product of her prayers. Yeah. Um, one day, she, she had been, I guess, witnessing this kind of going on for a while. I was just, just not really experiencing a lot of joy. She came into my room one day and she said, hey, I will never tell you what your relationship with God should look like. But I just feel like as my daughter, I have seen joy just deplete. Just I've mm. seen it just leave your life over time. Yeah. And I'm really worried about you. So can you at least just let me pray for you today? And that's all I'm asking is that you just let me pray for you. Yeah. I said, okay, cool. So she prayed for me that night, walked out of my room. And there was just this disturbance within me. It was just like after that prayer, I just knew something was off. Yeah. Like something was not right. Like yeah. my... So I had made a series of decisions that had led me down a path where although I was getting what I wanted, I was not finding fulfillment in what I wanted. And I came to the realization, honestly, I really truly believe also because of those prayers that night, that um, everything I had was everything I wanted, but there was one thing I needed that I didn't have, and that was Christ. Mm. And I really believe that it was the Holy Spirit and his power and his grace that even revealed that through that prayer that night. Yeah. So as soon as she walked out of the room, I just remember I got at the edge of my bed. I went on my knees and I just started weeping before the Lord. And mm. I was like, God, I have ran so far and so fast yeah. from you. And yeah. I'm now realizing that I'm actually lacking you. Wow. And I'll never forget it. My prayer was, 
um, God, I've, I've rebelled so much and I've said no to you so many times, but if you will just have me this one time, mm. and if you just, if you take me back this one time, I will live for you. I just give me that chance. Yeah. And something happened that night and I remember weeping and as I'm praying these prayers, I've never felt that before or after. I just remember sensing as though I'm pretty sure if my eyes were opened, I felt like I would have just seen Jesus at the edge of that bed. Like there was just such a weight yeah. that just came into the room that night and something just, it just snapped. Like yeah. I just felt like something snapped. I woke up the next morning started calling saying goodbye to all my friends <laughs> that no were in the way. world so, yeah Are you so, I, it was very it was very <laughs> abrupt for me it was Yo. just very abrupt i realized what having life without christ was it hit me and yeah. i never wanted to go back to that place again and yeah. i knew that i had created environments and spaces for me that were conducive to not experience Christ. Sheesh. So I picked up the phone. I started cutting ties with all these friends. They're like, are you okay? Is this like a crisis that you're going through? <laughs> like, maybe we need to talk. It's like, no, we don't need to talk. I think I'm okay. You know, I was in a relationship at that time. I remember calling the person I was in a relationship with and just being like, hey, yeah, I found Jesus wow. and I'm not going back. And Cold I remember turkey. the person being like, are you okay? Like, is this like a mental crisis? Like no one around me understood what was going on. Yeah. And I literally just cut ties with people, friends, yeah. spaces that I was involved in. The following week, I went to church. I rededicated my life to the Lord. Yeah. And I said, I'm never looking back. Wow. And then spent the next 10 years just growing in the Lord, being yeah. discipled. This time around, I had people around me that were actually ready to take that journey with yeah. me. And so what ended up happening is as I got back into the Lord, and back into a relationship with the Lord, my love started to grow in a healthy way. My understanding of Christ started to grow in a healthy way. Yeah. And now I began to realize that the reason why as a 13-year-old girl, I was so terrified of what God had called me to do was because that was apart from the context of intimacy with Christ. Mm. And I realized the deeper I fell in love with Christ, the more I understood what he had done for me and the more I began to see how flawed and broken and empty I was apart from him, that love that grew began to also change my desires. Yeah. And it began to change the view that I had of what I wanted to do in my life and the direction that I wanted to take. Yeah. And uh, so with, with baby steps and consistency and a healthy community, I began to grow in my relationship with God. And slowly my desires changed. And now that 13-year-old girl that was so terrified of ministry started to actually grow a deep love yeah. for serving God's people yeah. and for serving the local church. And from then on, God just restored a lot of the broken pieces that I had in my relationship with him. Yeah. Gave me a very renewed perspective of who he was as a father, not yeah. just as a God who demands and decides things for us, but as a loving father who actually has such a perfect plan and purpose laid out for us that yeah. if only we see him rightly, then we can also see what he has for right. us rightly. Right, right. And then from then on, never looked back. And uh, you know, today, here we are. Here we are. Here we are. You know what's so crazy about your story? This is truly unorthodox. If you look back at what set you off on the wrong path, yeah. it wasn't your desire for the world. It wasn't you wanted a party. It wasn't that you had doubts. It wasn't that you had failures. It wasn't that you had disappointments. Mm -hmm. You were literally running away from the call of God on yeah. your life. Yeah. And I want to highlight that <laughs> because I feel like today uh, a lot of people are running 100,000 miles per hour towards their purpose mm. and i feel like they don't really understand the weight right of the purpose right. of their purpose or what it is that god is truly trying to do in them right and then through them right i want to you know because i think this is going to serve as our conversation unfolds a little bit but like what was it about your call your purpose that led you to be like nah was it a healthy fear well, maybe it wasn't healthy because it led you down a different path but yeah. <laughs> what was it to be yeah. like hey god you're showing me this mm -hmm. and i'm gonna come not entitled yeah not feeling like i deserve this but just this is heavy i don't know if this is true and out of my fear i'm i'm dipping yeah. like, what, what was that you know if i'm being honest now in hindsight i genuinely think it was pride uh because the root cause of my need to run yeah it wasn't even fear of like, oh, how could God choose me to do this big thing? It wasn't. It was, how dare does God take away my choice? Yeah. How dare does God take away the chance for me to choose if I even want to do this? That's good. Why was he not even considerate of the fact that 
the passions in my heart of what I want to do as an adult is something yeah. very different. Yeah. I never wanted to be in ministry. Never had the slightest desire as a kid, as a, as a teen, as a preteen, as yeah. nothing. Like it was never there. Sign me and up for so, law. Yeah. Sign me up for law. I want yeah. to just go and fight people in court. Like I never, <laughs> never in my life was ministry ever a desire. And so yeah. as soon as that word was spoken over my life, it was immediate anger that took over. Mm. It was like, what kind of a God takes away my right to choose mm. the path of life I want to live? Wow, that's deep. That's deep. And that, that mentality is rooted in pride. Yeah. Because pride makes you think and makes you believe that your choices yeah. and your view of how your life should go is just so perfect and yeah. so great and so much better than anything God could do for you. Right. When in reality, you are a human being with such a limited vantage point and understanding. Yeah. You have no idea what even tomorrow is going to look like, right. let alone the next 25 years. And it was pride. And I was like, it, it's impossible to think that as a 13-year-old I could feel that, but it just goes to show how in our human nature mm. that aspect of sin really affects us right. from even that young age, yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. that anger, which is really rooted in pride of, God, I know better than you. How dare you choose what I'm, I should be doing? It really just goes to show the effects of sin, which can really start to show itself even from that young, tender age. Yeah, yeah. And so for me, it was anger. It's yeah. just like, how dare you? Yeah, you know. Now yeah. I'm just like, oh Lord, forgive me. Like, <laughs> yeah, never, yeah. Dumb thirteen year old, forgive yeah, everything I like, said. You know. But you know better now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> Sound like you've been humbled a couple of oh, times. Oh my goodness. Now I'm just yeah. like, Lord, whatever you say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just go with the flow. Sure, yeah, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's beautiful. I feel like we could spend a whole podcast episode just yeah. talking about that specific thing. Yeah. But uh, there are some other things that we want to discuss. And just really quick, wanted to highlight how beautiful it is that no matter how many steps you've taken away from the Lord, yeah. it's really just one step back. That's it's so just true. that one prayer, yeah. that one moment of right. surrender, and right. then you're back where you left off with the Lord. It right. just shows how gracious the Lord is. Ooh. And so I know me and my insecure self, I'm like, well, I'm going to need some time before I can trust you with yeah. what I have for you. Right. 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 But the Lord, just in his grace and his love, is like, all right, I receive so you, and yeah. now let's start working on your path. Um, Absolutely. What did that look like? So I want to fast forward a little bit. I'm sure there was a whole season of development and working through things and surrendering all over again and so on and so forth. But as you kind of saw yourself stepping into ministry, as you begin to see the Lord use you in this capacity, um, what did those initial years of ministry look like? And did you then envision what you would be doing now? No, that's a short answer. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. No, <laughs> did not envision that at all. Hello? Is uh, this hello? on? Is this on? No. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I didn't. So when I got back into ministry after that that process of getting back to a right place with the Lord, yeah. honestly, I was just like, God, whatever capacity, I could set up chairs. Like, I'm pretty content with doing yeah. that. And honestly, when I got back into ministry, that was my first... I was showing up before service started and yeah. helping set up the chairs in the room yeah. for the people that were going to come to worship. Yeah. And then from then on, like moving on to then, you know, joining in the worship team because somebody was like, oh, you need you have a good voice. You need to get on the team. It's like, well, I don't think. So. OK, cool. Like, <laughs> I guess I'll do it. Like and even that almost being pushed to do it. Yeah. And then from then growing, you know, spending and there were obviously years of, of, of time spent yeah. in these roles. Yeah. And then after that, being like, hey, like there's just a leadership gift on your life. Like we want you to join like the youth leadership team and like really contribute. It's like, really? You think so? Okay, great. Like, and all, all this time, the mm. stuff that people were calling out of my life was not things that I could see in me, mm. but it was things that others saw in me that were drawing and calling it out. And, and I'm, so which I'm good. thankful for because it just so goes good. to show how important being in a community is because what you may not see in yourself, others have the vision to see and therefore pull it out and help develop it. Right. And that happened. And then from, you know, from setting chairs to, you know, joining a team to, to worship, lead worship. And then from then on to joining a youth leadership team. And then I joined the youth leadership team. And, you know, uh, I remember the youth pastor at the time was like, hey, I think you have a gift of communicating and I want you to start teaching the youth. And I was like, you're definitely wrong. <laughs> like, that's not me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, He's like, yeah. no, you really are. And if you're going to be under my leadership, you're going to you're going to wow. train and grow and learn how to communicate. Yeah. And I'll never forget it. I used to show up like once a month on a Friday and I remember the very first thing I taught the youth, I'll never forget it. It was a lesson on Abraham. Uh -huh. Thank God I don't remember the details because I feel like I would uh, cringe if I did. I want the details. No, I don't because I'm pretty sure it was also probably all wrong. <laughs> but, um, but thank God. There's um, a word in there somewhere. <laughs> thank, yeah, something something <laughs> yeah, happened in there. Yeah, yeah. And I remember the youth pastor would sit in the back of the room, listen to me, take notes. And as soon as I'm done, he'd be like, all right, let's talk about how you did wow. good and what you did not do good in, what you need to work on. Yeah. Next Friday, I need you to improve on this and come back. And I used to hate him for that. It's like, why are you doing this to me? Like, I, this is not even the terms of agreement for why I joined. Like, right, right. And, and again, and, and I remember one time after a while of this going on, 
um, he sat me down and he said, look, you have no idea where the Lord is taking you and yeah. what he's going to do through your life. But what I do know is that this space is not where you're going to land. This is your training ground. And I need you to take advantage of My this training goodness. ground because I, you have no idea and I have no idea what the next five, ten years yeah. is going to look like for you. Yeah. But what you do know is God has spoken a word over your life. Yeah. And what you do know is that that word is going to eventually be fulfilled. Yeah. And the last thing you want to do is see the fulfillment of that word but feel unprepared for that season you're walking into. Yeah. So this is not where you land. This is where you train. Right. And I need you to start training. It's beautiful. And that it's conversation good. really hit. It's I was good. like, all right, let's do it. Yeah. And we did that for about five years. And hello. And then hello. Five. Five years. Not five months. Five years. Not five days. Five years. Okay. And then after five years, the Lord made it very clear that my season um, in Toronto was coming to an end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And hold I on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before we get to yeah, that, because yeah. that's a whole story, yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's that's gonna serve as a launching pad. Yeah. But we got to break this down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, Christina. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Here, okay, I've got an analysis of what's going on in our culture today. Mm -hmm. You can agree, disagree, but I'm going to put it out there. Okay. I feel like part of the problem in American Christianity today is people are not plugged into their local church. Mm -hmm. um, they attend Bedside Baptist. Yes. And so they come in. I mean, the stats, I think Barna did a... a, a Barna a, Group had done a research recently on I that. I think yeah. they say most church attenders come once every six weeks. Yeah. It's crazy. Yep. Like people say, this is my home church. This is the place I call home. Yep. I'm showing up once every six weeks. Yep. Staggering, yep. staggering. Um, but everybody's trying to figure out what they're meant to do. Mm -hmm. You discovered that you had a will, but that wasn't the Lord's will. And then secondly, there were some things that the Lord had to do in you before mm -hmm. you could even walk out what the Lord had to do in you. Absolutely. You needed pastors, leaders, community yep. to A, identify the gifts in you, yep. make space for you to grow in your gifts, right. and then hold you accountable to your gifts. Right. Okay. The reason why this is important to note is because I feel like a lot of the reason why people have a failure to launch or the reason why people are confused as to what their purpose is, is because they're not in community. Yeah. They don't have people outside themselves yeah. to help them, to guide them, to sit them down, to love on them, to call things That's out right. of them. And then secondly, if people do discover their gifts early, they don't have the character development. You did this for five years. Yeah. So what ends up happening is people blow up overnight mm -hmm. and then they blow up their life overnight. overnight yeah. And so they were the biggest thing mm -hmm. last year and this year. What happened? Yeah. What went wrong? Right. Like what? What? And so I wanted you to speak into this a little bit. Like, what does it look like to honor the process? Because mm. I think so often we're trying to skip the process. process yeah. I think about how like God was taking the Israelites out of Egypt. Right. The Bible tells us. I think it's in Exodus that He could have easily taken, taken them, them a short shorter route, route yeah. but they would have to go through Philistine country. Yeah. And they they were slaves for the last 400 years. Right. They would have been obliterated. Right. And so because God knew that they didn't have the strength, the, tac the tactics, the leadership, yeah. the military background mm -hmm. to defend themselves, mm -hmm. he takes them the longer route mm -hmm. because he wanted them in, there in one piece. And so can you speak to why the longer, the longer route is part of God's design and purpose for everyone and yeah. how we need to get back to honoring that? Yeah, that's such a great question. And I think my answer to that would be the short version because I think refinement is necessary. Yeah. I think a lot of times we try to get to places of influence, to places of fulfillment without allowing our character to be developed in such a way where we can be sustained once we get yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you right now, looking at where God has me today yeah. and looking at the weight mm. of what I have to carry today, yeah. if I had gotten here mm. without having gone through that process, yeah. this wouldn't have lasted for six months. Yeah. I would have been out, not just out from the calling. I think I honestly would have probably been out from, from the, the faith, faith. Oh yeah, because I would have had such a different view of oh, yeah. the way God works. Yeah. And so I think it's so important, one, for the process of it refining you. Your character has to be refined. Yes. Your intimacy with the Lord has to be strengthened. Right. I've learned time and time and time and time and time again for the past now almost eight years mm. that my goodness, it is not gifts, resources, or people. Yeah. It's intimacy that sustains yeah. you. If you are not close to the Lord, there are so many things in ministry, regardless yeah. of what capacity you're called to serve, yeah. that are ready to take you out. Right, right. It's it's you are standing yeah. on battleground. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, where yeah. you are. Yeah. There is nothing glamorous yeah. about being in ministry. Right. It's it's fulfilling because you are 
you are laboring for the mission of the church and That's for right. the sake of the gospel, yeah. but you are getting beat up left, right, and center. You are <laughs> facing so much warfare yeah. constantly, yeah, yeah. privately in your private life, right. publicly in your ministry. Right. You are constantly dealing with so many things that can take you out in a matter of a day, in yeah. a matter of one incident, one, one situation, call. one phone call, one bad conversation with yeah. someone, one misunderstanding with a person. One, yeah. you, it's literally, you're, and you realize the reason why I didn't give up yesterday when mm. that person talked to me the way that they did, the reason why I didn't give up last week when I went through the worst betrayal of my life, the reason why I didn't give up a month ago when that medical report was mm. not what it needed to be is because of my connection and my intimacy with God. That's good. And if there is no abiding in him, you cannot sustain, you cannot survive the waves yeah. and the storms that come through ministry. Yeah. And so I think that process, allowing the process to take as long as it needs to take before you step into the fullness of what God has for you yeah. is so important because I also feel that in that place, God is developing and strengthening the muscles of intimacy. Yeah. Because he knows if you don't learn to increase your appetite and your craving for him and then learn how to fulfill fill that craving and appetite in his presence, then when the distractions of ministry come, yeah. when the demands of the calling that you are now yeah. stepping into come, yeah. you will not know where to go to be recharged, That's to be right. re replenished, to be refreshed. That's right. And so I'm so glad that in those years, t total of 10 years, if we're really looking at it, yeah. of, of God hiding me in that place and teaching me that, look, ministry titles come and go, right. opportunities come and go. Yeah. Today, you could be doing this tomorrow. It could be all something right. different. Right. But what will never change yeah. is the proximity of you knowing how close I am to you yes. and you being fulfilled from that place. Yes. And I think God had to teach that to me earlier on. Yeah. And the reason why I think it was also important for him to teach me that earlier on is because I'm also, by nature, I'm a very type A person. Okay. I'm very independent. I don't like to ask for help. I like to get things done on my own. Yeah. I'm very much like, let's figure out a way to solve this problem. Let's get things thing done. Like I don't, I don't like things dragging. I don't... And I think God had to teach me through that process. No, you're going to have to learn how yeah. to come to me, yeah. how to depend on me, yeah. how to ask me for wisdom, how to ask me for right. help, right. how to ask me for solutions. You're going to have to come to me when you're weary and tired That's and word. find a way to know that in those moments, only I can refresh and restore you. Yeah. And the only way I'm going to teach you that is if I extend this season right now. Because yeah. once you're in the fullness of that, yeah. you're not going to know how to find me if you right. don't know how to find me now. That's good. And I think... That's why that process is so important. I think it's important because your character needs to be refined. And I think in that process too, God has to just develop those muscles of spiritual intimacy with him yeah. so that you never forget where your source is. That's a word. Yeah. That's a word. I love how you gave a general response and a personal one too, yeah. because everybody's call is tailor-made mm. and you have to consider personality, genetic makeup, upbringing, experience, yeah. trauma, right. all of that plays a role right. in how God develops and strengthens and prepares you for Absolutely. what he ultimately has for you. Absolutely. Yeah. So speak to it. You, so you got this phone call. There's an opportunity to leave Toronto. Why are you leaving? First of all, Yeah. what happened? So honestly, I never imagined I would leave. Um, I never wanted to leave. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. never imagined leaving Canada. Let yeah. me just put it out there. Yeah. <laughs> I love Canada, okay, forever <laughs> in my heart. <laughs> um, no, but I never thought that my life there would come to an end. It was never part of the plan. Yeah. And um, finally in 2015, the Lord started sort of preparing me like, hey, don't get overly attached because mm. this is not, this is not, this is not where you land. This is just where you're going to launch off of. Sheesh. And I was like, no, God, but why don't, why can't we make this the landing spot? Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. this is good to land. We yeah. can land here. Yeah. God has said, no, I'm going to launch you from here, but you're not going to land here. Yeah. So don't get attached. Yeah. And I ignored it because that's what you do when you don't want to hear what the Lord <laughs> has to say. At least you didn't run away this yeah, time. This time I didn't run away. <laughs> yeah, I said, yeah, I'm going to yeah. just stay here, yeah, but I'm going to yeah. ignore you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and a year, you know, that this all is going on. And as this is happening, um, a man comes into my life. Mm. A wonderful man comes into my life. Mm -hmm. um, I had been single for four years. Mm. I didn't. I was not entertaining anybody. I didn't really care about relationships. I had finally come to a very sweet spot in my relationship with yeah. God where I don't know how to describe it. And I hope that as people hear this, it doesn't sound like the typical Christian cliche, corny thing to say. I don't know how else to describe it, but I genuinely was at a place in my life with the Lord. Yeah, single and secure. Man, <laughs> single, secure, satisfied, yeah, yeah. all of the above. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just, I felt so full. Like I yeah. never felt like, oh, I need to start considering marriage. I yeah. need to start looking at, 
you know, none of that at all. Like I, I was just living my best life and I was so fulfilled. Yeah. And I had finally like just gotten into that sweet spot with him and I was like, man, I never want to leave this place. Yeah. And I'm I'm feeling great. Yeah. Um yeah, and then a man comes into my life. Hello. <laughs> In that space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I get introduced to this wonderful man uh-huh. named Paul, mm. who many of you may have already seen around. Mm-hmm. Um, just this beautiful human being, mm-hmm. bald, yeah. wears glasses, a little bit of dork, but handsome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hilarious. Uh, hilarious, yeah, undercover yeah. comedian. Yeah. But so I meet him, and uh, I remember when I met him, I was just like, okay, great, one more friend. This is fantastic. Like, <laughs> oh, not a big no, deal. Not <laughs> like, friend. one more friend. You this put is him great. in the friend zone. Oh, 100%. Immediately, huh? I didn't. I remember the first day People we met. Like you, man. You're the, the problem. <laughs> the first day we met, let me tell you a story, yeah. side story, really funny. Yeah. The first day we met, um, we had a really quick exchange, and as we're about to leave, I'm like, Please, in my head, I'm thinking, please don't ask for my number. Oh, please no. don't ask for my contact because if you do, man, it's going to ruin everything. Like that. And, and I was just like, God, You're trying don't. to block your blessings. No, I was like, I don't want it. I don't want it, Lord. I'm man. good. Don't. And then he didn't. And that yeah, was great. Man. I was like, good. We're good. You know? You know what I'm learning about you in this conversation? Yeah. You're a runner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you almost lost that on. <laughs> Ready to go. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Like, please, Lord, I don't want it. And then he didn't, and yeah. it was fine. But yeah, then yeah, he yeah. circled back around and started mm. messaging me other ways. And so anyways, uh-huh. uh, we met in 2014. Yeah. And uh, he was the first person that I met after four years of being single and in my really content place yeah. where I felt like I need to really pray about this guy because yeah. I don't know if there's something there that maybe the Lord is doing. And uh, I remember we became friends, and we're both very direct when it comes to certain things. Yeah. You know, like we just kind of cut to the chase. And I remember after about six months of being friends, he was like, hey, I'm just going to like put it out there. Like, I'm not trying to be another friend. Yeah, like, I'm actually uh-huh. wanting to pursue you yeah. for marriage. But I know that that could be really abrupt. And if you I don't know who's whoever's listening and whoever knows Paul knows this. It's yeah. very like, I don't want to like, you know, scare you or anything. Yeah. But my intentions yeah, are yeah. I want to <laughs> pursue you for marriage. And I just want you to know, you know, yeah, very yeah, like yeah, clear. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, OK, let's let's see where this goes, yeah. because you have to realize when we met, it wasn't like your Oh my gosh, head over heels. I'm this is like love at first sight. I'm gonna marry him. It wasn't that. It wasn't yeah. there was no sparks, none of that at all. At least not on my end. Like wow. it wasn't like a I'm thinking about marrying this guy. Okay. So when the conversation came up, I was like, you know what? You're actually the first person that my heart feels okay about praying and really seeing what the Lord has. It's just a peace. There was just a really great sense unexplainable, of peace. Just, just unexplainable. Peace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. much peace. Yeah. So we took some time, we prayed on it, and then I felt peace to just kind of like really get to know him more. So we started getting to know each other. I took a couple of trips out to visit, to spend time. And the more we started spending time around each other, I was like, man, this, this man is it. Like, yeah. this man is a person I really can see myself for the rest of my life with. Yeah. And he really, not, not just from a ministry standpoint, yeah. but just from a personality standpoint. And personality-wise, we're actually the complete opposite of each Polar. other. Literally Polar black, opposites. white, day, yeah. night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But something about how different he was from me was a huge point of attraction for me. Yeah. And I always felt like just talking to him, there was always a sense of peace I can find in that. Yeah. There was always comfort. He was very gentle, very loving, very supportive. There was a lot of things about him, a lot of qualities, very patient, very soft-spoken, yeah. very slow-spoken to. Um, and there's just a lot of things about him as a man I saw, and I said, oh, my goodness. Why are you still single? Why are you still? We're getting married. Yeah. Like, it's happening. Yeah. You women, Let's man. Do it. You go from Let's zero do it. to 100 real quick. That, uh, it, was, it was a done deal. <laughs> yeah. I said, we're getting married. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and for, for, for those who do know, we dated nine months. We were engaged after nine months of just dating. Can I tell a funny story? Go for it. So this goes back to how <laughs> you were we there, met. Actually, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> we met ten years ago. Yes. At a conference in Seattle. Yes. So we were all invited guests. Yep. <laughs> and I remember it was I don't know why, but people made it such a big deal. Yeah. About because I didn't know at the moment. Yeah. But you guys were very private about the relationship. We actually kind of like made it official right before that trip. Yeah. Oh, really? I yeah, didn't know that. it was a very brand... I mean, it was like maybe a week old in that yeah, moment. Yeah. I, I remember you guys were going on walks and everybody's like, oh, look, shh, yeah. going on walks. I'm like, fam, they're just, they're in a relationship. Let them live, <laughs> That's right? That's how you were talking about a lot yeah, of people. I was yeah. like, what? <laughs> they're on yeah. a walk, you know yeah. what I mean? And then I remember uh, Paul and I were sharing a dorm and I like, I don't know why, one night, I'm an introvert, yeah. so I went back to the room mm-hmm. early. Yeah. It was a lot of new people. Mm-hmm. It was like a youth camp, yeah. a bunch of people. <laughs> I, I remember said, that, yeah. I said, get me out of here. <laughs> So I'm in there, and the only other person that comes is our other introverted friend, Paul. Paul, yep, yep. So mind you, I don't really know about you two, but we're we're just laying in bed talking in different beds. (laughs) 
<laughs> Let me clarify. No worries. Yeah, it's yeah, all good. Yeah, yeah. It's your man. Yeah. <laughs> so we were talking. And then we started talking about relationships. Yeah. And he's just like, he didn't tell me he was with you, but mm-hmm. he was describing you. Mm-hmm. He was like, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for a worship leader. I think it'd just it'd make, the, make the ministry effective. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah. I guess. <laughs> I was like, you got your eyes on somebody? He's like, something like that. Yeah. I was like, I'm praying about it. I'm yeah. like, fam, he's yeah. in a whole relationship. <laughs> and he's just so nonchalant about yeah, it. Yeah. But granted, it was the first night or yeah. the first time we had met. Yeah. And lo and behold, you guys made it. So we did the conference. Mm-hmm. And then right after the conference, you guys went official. Yeah. Like to the people there and then publicly. And right. He got ordained shortly after that. And I think yeah. at that point it was just, uh, and I think we had come to a realization by that point we were getting married. Yeah. So it was like at this point, uh, there's so nothing that we need to figure public. out. Yeah. We already yeah, know yeah. this is where it's going. Yeah. And so it was, you know, it was, it was done. But yeah, we met in 2014. I, I sense a, there was a sense of peace that came over me. I knew he was the one um, after that time of prayer and just building the friendship. Yeah. And nine months dated, got engaged, nine months engaged, got married. <sighs> when you know, you know. When you know, you know. I was and at that wedding. It was lit. It, yeah. Y'all yeah. had like a thousand people there. It was lit there. for a lot of people. Yes. Crazy. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It, yeah. Um, <laughs> little traumatic but yes yeah, yeah. uh but yeah we got and you know there were there were three conversations we had before we got engaged that yeah. set everything for us good the first one was what do you believe god is calling you to do with your life that's because good. i want to know if i can complement that yeah if i'm going to complement that or if i'm going to hinder that that's good uh, if god is calling you to be a missionary in mongolia like i'm that's, that's right. not yeah yeah so we need to you know yeah. we need to know i don't want to stand in the way of what god has called you to do and i know you don't either right so what do you feel like god has called you to do do you feel like there's clarity on that and yeah. i remember that was the first conversation we had literally i think it was three weeks into officially dating um man take notes this is how you yeah date three weeks because in, my, in yeah. my mind it was like all right emotions and all that stuff will come later we right. will have enough time to like huh. just love on each other and be all you know but we need to just get some of this stuff straight now because you also don't want a lot of your emotions to be invested in something or yeah. into a situation only to find out later that we can't really move forward past this point or if we do yeah. one of us is going to have to make a really big sacrifice yes. that hopefully yeah, yeah. that person doesn't become resentful of later on in the in the marriage that's right and so the first one was what do you feel like god is calling you to do and it was very clear we both knew we were called into ministry and we both knew we had a clear calling for church planting done that was that was a very clear yeah. um conversation the second conversation I'm going to save that uh, because it's personal. It's still personal. Okay. Yeah. But there will be a time when I think it'll be a little bit more clear. And when it does, I think it'll make sense. I just I'll want s- the exclusive on shaping the culture. I'll when give you yes. the yeah, second yeah, one. Yeah. I'll tell you. <laughs> and then um, and then the third one um, I remember we talked about. So ministry, the second one was a, a bit of a personal one. And then the third conversation that we had that was kind of like this is going to be a deal breaker or not. Um, it was, hey, I, I want to know what is it that you expect of me as your wife? in the future. What are some of those expectations that you have of me? When you envision me as your wife, what are some of the expectations right. you have of me? I want to know yeah. if I have the capacity to meet those expectations. Um, if I need to do some work in me before I am ready to meet those expectations, yeah. maybe there's things I need to heal from that I'm not able to do. And yeah. you know, what, what do you envision when you see me as your wife and, yeah. and what are some of those expectations yeah. and vice versa? And the reason why that question was so important for me was because I came from a broken home where I never saw my parents together. My parents were were separated. They were not even together by the time I was even born. So I grew up with my mom my whole life, never really had any close relationship with my father. Um, Till this day, it's really not there. And so growing up and not seeing a healthy marriage in my home, and then beyond that, even in my extended family, seeing a lot of marriages crumble, had really created a big fear of marriage in my mind. Mm. And I, I always wondered, did these individuals know what expectations they had of each other? Right. Were, did they ever sit and talk about what yeah. they desired out of each other in that relationship or in that marriage? And so I, I knew what type of hmm. wound I was bringing into the relationship. Wow. Um, it's very true when they say that the wound of that a woman carries when her father is absent, you don't realize that until you're much older. You don't mm. feel it as a kid as much, yeah, yeah, but yeah. when you're older, you begin to realize what you never experienced yeah. as a result of an absent father. Right. And in many ways, it also changes how you develop as a woman. Like I, I, I had to grow up with the mentality of, I've got to protect myself, I've mm. got to defend myself, I've got to look out for myself, yeah. I've got to fight for myself, yeah. uh, because I don't have a sense of like a male authority over my life that can do that for me. And it might sound like, ooh, 
like super like feminist, you know, like you got it. Yeah. But if we really break it down, yeah. when you get old enough to start thinking about marriage and start mm -hmm. thinking about what submission to a man looks like when yeah. you never had a man you had to submit to before mm -hmm. that or an authority you never experienced, right. it really begins to create conflicting um conflicting like views in your mind of what this is going to look like. Okay. And so I remember my third you know, conversation with him was like, hey, what's your expectation? Because I know the type of wounds I'm bringing into this marriage. Yeah. And I know the type of stuff that the Lord has healed for the most part, but is still healing. Yeah. And I just want to know, what do you expect of me? Yeah. And, and then him asking the same. And that conversation was the longest conversation we had. Hmm. And I also feel that that conversation is what really led to the decision mm. to move forward in marriage. Wow. Um, being able to take a step back after that and say, hey, I may not meet that expectation perfectly, but I love you enough to try every day. Wow. And I'm willing to do that. That's beautiful. And, um, and That's beautiful. so by God's grace, yeah. And, and you know, you know this, but for those who are listening, uh, Paul and I are not just different in personality but even our family dynamic is very different. Yeah. Paul comes from a full family, parents in the household, siblings, just your typical perfect, you know, picture perfect family dynamic. Mine's yeah. not like that at all. <laughs> uh, and so just even learning to now come into a marriage and into a union with someone who grew up seeing something very different and hopefully expecting that for himself, mm. but knowing that, hey, his wife never had that experience. So right. what she brings to the table is going to look very different. Right, right. Um, and so, yeah, that was the conversation that really allowed us to move forward. Yo, so this is, oh my gosh, so much going on here. Mm -hmm. um, for one, I can't help but notice that you guys were having very intentional conversations early on. Yeah. I think when I think about relationships early on, I'm thinking about, do we look good together? Do we like the same kind of movies? Yeah. Do we? Does she love hip hop? Like I live, love hip hop. Can we go to concerts together? Yeah. I'm thinking about like, are we gonna travel together? What does this look like? But you guys came in, and I mean, you said this earlier too. I feel like I'm, I'm sure the attraction was there initially, but that wasn't really the focal point. That was that came later on. Yeah. And and I think that what has helped you guys flourish in your marriage mm -hmm. is that you started off the marriage and you started actually really the relationship yeah. having the conversations that most of us are not having in mm -hmm. dating relationships mm -hmm. we're not asking the question what is your call yeah. here's my call mm -hmm. how do we align or how do we mm -hmm. you know go our separate ways go our yeah. separate ways yeah. you know like yeah, that yeah. stuff comes after the fact right. you know right. or being able to you had the self awareness to identify the wounds that the Lord had healed you from mm -hmm. and the wounds that you were still working through right. and to have a very honest conversation with him about, Hey, this is, this is not just what I know I've gone through, but I know how this shows up right. in my love. Right. I know how this shows up in my friendships and yeah. relationships. Yeah. And this is how it might bleed into or spill into yeah. our romantic. Right. Right. Can you talk a little bit? To, it was that the four years of singleness that helped you get to that? Like, how did yeah. you get to a place in your singleness where you were that intentional yeah. with picking a mate. Yeah. You know what's so interesting? I feel like when you really begin to walk with the Lord um, wholeheartedly and in full availability to him, yeah. he begins to show you the areas in your life that he needs to do a work in. Yeah. And it doesn't all get revealed to you at one time, but in seasons and in phases, the Lord begins to sort of show you, okay, I've worked on this part, but we need to now work on this. Right. And it wasn't long before for me where the Lord started to reveal... Um, I used to struggle a lot with like anger issues. Mm. I used to have really bad anger problems. Um, I'm ready to like just <laughs> fight somebody <laughs> any day, any That's time. Why but I, I didn't. I never, I never, I never got violent. Yeah, I yeah, never yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's there. But yeah. but if you need a friend, I'm Christina, there. Like when I was I'm going there. through a hard time a couple of years ago, I just made that one phone call. <laughs> I was ready. You, you said all I needed to hear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's I all ready. I needed to hear. We are ready to go. I'm ready to go. And I don't know if this is the Italian side of me. I don't know I what side it. of me it is. I love it. Uh, but have you have you seen the movie Inside Out? Yeah, I saw the second one. The second the one. one. Yeah, the yeah, second yeah, one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. You know the guy with the red flames? <laughs> That's the guy that's managing the headquarters in here. Okay, a lot of times, burn it the, down, burn it to the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I kid. That's the Lord has, has done a work. I'm not okay, but I'm just saying it's just a joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I resonate with him a lot. Yeah, 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 uh, but yeah. so I used to have a lot of anger issues. Yeah. And I never understood where it was coming from, what was going on. And then I'll never forget it. At one point, there used to be a mentor that spoke a lot into my life, and she pulled me aside one day and she said, "Hey." Do you feel like maybe this anger is showing up as anger because there's maybe hurt that you haven't mm. healed from? I was like, what do you mean? 
And she goes, well, you wow. know, sometimes when there's wounds that haven't healed properly, the symptom of that wound still existing mm. is that it turns up and shows up as anger. Sheesh. And that's just one way, one emotion in which that shows wow. up in. And maybe for you, you're not just angry because people are dumb or things are happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that anger is a, is, a, is a symptom of a deeper rooted issue that has to do with maybe disappointment or hurt or something that you feel like you haven't healed from. Wow. And when she said it, I immediately knew. I was mm. like, the only thing in my life that I feel like a trauma that I maybe had carried for a long time was the anger that I felt towards an absent father. Mm. And to be honest with you, like even the absent father, it wasn't even, I think it was more so how could you let, you know, watching my mother be so strong and watching my mother work so hard yeah. to provide, to protect, to nurture, to be literally a father and a mother. Yeah. That, I think it was anger in her defense, That if that makes sense. Like, like I'm angry for you, yeah, you know? It's not that good. he's directly done something to me, like yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I don't, whatever, but yeah, yeah. it was more so, hmm. she is the person I love and care for the most that means the world to me. Yeah. And to see her in this world suffer on her own, it's almost like, how dare you do this to her? Yeah. So it's anger for her, if that makes sense. But I didn't realize that as I'm feeling anger for her, I'm also allowing something to grow deeper roots in my own mm. life. My mother is having a great time. She's with the Lord, happy. She's enjoying her life. She's just so wow. full in Jesus and all that. I'm out here literally taking offended on anger for, for her, her, offended yeah. for her, and yeah. allowing roots of bitterness and anger wow. to grow so deep that it's now manifesting in something that's really ugly. Yeah. That coupled with, I used to be very triggered with like male authority mm. and I never understood kind of why, but I used to always feel like, oh, you don't get to have a say over me. Like, and it was a very subtle way that it would come up. It, yeah. Like it wasn't like an aggressive thing. It was yeah, very yeah. subtle. Yeah. And I remember just when she pointed that out, I was like, man, you're right. Like, first of all, I am angry. And yes, I think my anger is rooted in the sense of just pain and disappointment I have felt towards my father. And yeah. I think that disappointment and pain I felt towards him has also revealed itself in the way I respond to other males around me. And you're right, what do I do? And yeah. she said, well, the first step is you've acknowledged it. Mm. Now we gotta pray and we gotta yeah. do the deeper work. Yeah. And so for four years while I was single, that was what God was really working wow. out of my life. Yeah. Um, I had to learn to forgive my father and it was the mm. hardest till this day. I think the most painful and hardest journey I've ever gone through in my life yeah. was learning to forgive a man who never said, I'm sorry. Mm. And I don't think people man. realize that it's one thing to forgive when people own up to what they've yeah. done to hurt you, yeah. but learning to forgive to people that you will more than likely never hear an apology from is the true test, I think, of not only emotional, stretching and growth, but also spiritual stretching and growth. That's right. Learning to release the offender, learning to release the pain, learning to really leave it in God's hands and say, God, this is your part to worry. Help me to just get through mine. Yeah. And um, and that was the thing I had to come to. And that's what it took four years. It was mm. like, you mean to tell me I have to forgive him even though he'll never say I'm sorry? Mm. She was like, yeah, you're going to have to let it go. And you're going to have to let it go in God's hands. You're not just yeah. letting it go in anything. You're letting it go in his hands. And yeah have to release it. And if you don't, this is what I'll never forget. She said, if you don't, and you can carry on with holding this grudge and offense and anger and bitterness, and you can keep going the path that you're in. But she said, I want you to know, Christina, that one day, I don't know how many years from now it will be, one day in 10 years and 15 years and 20 years, you're going to be somebody's wife. Mm. God willing, you're going to be somebody's mother. And everything you never had the chance to get out on him they will be the victims that are going to have to endure My that God. punishment. My God. She said, do you want your future husband and your children to endure the punishment that you felt like you couldn't give your, your father? father? Yeah. If you want to do that yeah. and also lead, by the way, your family down a path of destruction, keep going what you're going. But yeah. if, you're, if you don't, you're going to have to do the hard work now of healing so that your future spouse and your future children can experience a healed version mm. of you, not a bitter version of you mm. that is constantly giving out the punishment and putting it on them yeah. just because you never felt like you could punish the person you want to punish. Yeah, yeah. When she said that, it was a big, and, and the reason that hit home for me is because I saw so many failed marriages in my family. And I said, I would rather die single mm. than get married and, and add on to the cycle of my family's history. Mm. And so I knew that there was a healthy, small desire in the midst of the fear of hopefully one day getting married, becoming a mother and all that stuff but I also knew that I had to work on this thing if I had to break the cycle that I had seen in my household. Yeah. And so I went through a very painful journey for four years of confronting the pain, of releasing it to God, of professing forgiveness constantly, yeah. and then learning, my goodness, mm. I don't know if Jesus understood, maybe he did, 
Um, I don't know if Jesus understood the weight that we would feel when he said, yeah. pray for your enemies. Yeah. Not that my father was an enemy, but somebody that yeah. has offended you or yes. somebody that has made your life uncomfortable. Yeah. Learning to pray for my father, yeah. good prayers. Yeah. Like good prayers. Uh, now we're talking about sanctification. Woo. Yeah. Man, I've never been so tested in my life. Yeah. And it was almost like, God, let me just write write this prayer out. He's like, no, I need you to pray <laughs> this prayer. I need you to profess it. Um, and I and just learning as part of that forgiveness, learning to pray for him, knowing that he single-handedly was a person that had contributed to some of the deepest pain in my life. <laughs> was the hardest thing I had to do. Yeah. But I knew that if I didn't get to that point of doing that, one day my future family would pay the price. Mm. And I didn't want them, never having had anything to do with this, to be the the recipients of punishment and pain. Yeah. So, um, yeah. My goodness, are we on a podcast or is this a therapy session? This is... <laughs> Man. <laughs> I love it. No, I think this is important to lean into because oftentimes in Christian faith, um, when we do talk about singleness, and I can talk extensively about this because I have seen it time and time again, the conversation is shallow and it, the conversation is very short. Yeah. It's, this is your time to serve the Lord mm -hmm. or this is your opportunity to be content. Right. Those are the only messages we get for single right. people. Right. But what I love about what you're saying here is, yeah, sure, the Lord is teaching you how to be content mm -hmm. and, and sure you had gotten to a point, point where you would be okay if mm -hmm. you weren't, but... You are also doing the deep work mm -hmm. and not just spiritual work. I mean, it's intertwined. I mean, right. spirituality bleeds into this and right. faith also marries right. itself to right. a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. But there was an opportunity to really work on yourself as an individual. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that has paid dividends in your marriage and in your ministry. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you, what does it look like? I, Cause you, you done the healing work. I'm sure you're still being healed. I, I'm just one of those guys who believe that he on this side of eternity, healing is just going to be a lifelong it is. Prog, uh, progress or yeah. what have you process. Um, but I wanted to ask you like, as you guys aligned yourselves in purpose, you had that conversation, mm -hmm. you knew that he's someone that understood your wounds and made room for it. What did it look, because it's one thing to sit down and have a long conversation about that. Yeah, It's a whole another <laughs> thing to live <laughs> it out. That's right. And as church planters. Right. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so like, yeah. what did that look like to be like, okay, I think I've got peace. Not I think I have peace and I think he's the guy for yeah. me going through that process, saying that I do's, and mm -hmm. then now you're living in the reality of the conversation. Of the conversation, yeah. And you know, yeah, you're living in the reality. Um, <laughs> who, our, our first year of marriage <laughs> was held together by the grace of the Holy Spirit <laughs> and his presence. Yeah. <laughs> Not that, I mean. Yeah, 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 no, I get it. I wanna, okay, let me just say this. I wanna say this as a disclaimer. Please. Um, like, I want people to understand yes. that there is already a lot of facades of these great marriages, mm. ministry and marriage combinations that are so beautiful and er so perfect and so aspiring. And oh my God, they look so good together. And they go out and they preach together. And like he finishes her sentences and she does his. And oh, they have a book coming out together. And like they're doing tours together. Like <laughs> I love that for you, but I want people to understand Talk that like it. the reality of doing marriage and ministry is, oh my Lord, the <laughs> hardest thing. <laughs> The hardest thing. And I don't ever want to paint a picture to anyone that our marriage is perfect. Yeah. It's not. It's good. Man, Paul and I had to fight. We had to work on each other. We had to fight for each other. Mm. We had to build. We had to repent to God about a lot of things. We had, our marriage is far from, pre what I will say is our marriage is always progressing. Yeah. But it's far from perfect. Right. And I don't want to give this impression that it is this like picture. Per I don't, please, I don't want you to wish, oh, I wish I had you. No, like pray for God to bless your marriage because everyone's journey is different and it comes with its Absolutely. own trials and its own seasons of stretching. Yeah. Um, and I love, I mean, I love Paul. I love my husband. Yeah. I'm, I'm so blessed to be his wife. And yeah. I'm so thankful that of every single person on this earth, God mm. saw fit for me to walk with him for the rest of my life. Yeah. He is truly my biggest blessing. He's my biggest supporter. He is my biggest shoulder to lean on. Yeah. He is my teacher. He is my leader. He is my provider in so many ways, emotionally, spiritually, yeah. mentally, even yeah. physically. Hello. Shout out we to that Amazon account. That, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> but shout out to that Amazon yeah, Prime account. Yeah, yeah. Um, Starbucks account. He, Starbucks account, all of the above. Yeah, he yeah. is 
We love him, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love him, and I'm so blessed to have walked this life with him as far as we have, and it's only been eight years. But I also know that our journey has been has been hard. It's not been easy. We got married, and um, no one decided to warn us that, hey, maybe when you get married, take a couple of years off first and like yeah. let your marriage fly a little, yeah. take off yeah. before you get into church planting. Yeah. No one told us that. Yeah. So we were on our flight back from our honeymoon when we started working on church planting. That's crazy. how crazy we are. And crazy. by the way, when it comes to work ethic, we're both type A's. Uh, we are both workaholics, we're both type A's, we're both cut from the same cloth when yeah. it comes to how we work and what, how we get things done. So I remember on our flight back from our honeymoon, while we're looking at photos on one hand of our honeymoon photos, we, there's an iPad out on the other hand taking yeah. notes about what we need to do for church. This right. was our flight back. Yeah, yeah. So that to say, we got back from our honeymoon and we were immediately immersed in the depth of all things church planting. Yeah. And the preparation for that was about a year long. And there is a lot that goes into that. Uh, you carry the weight of what you know God has called you to do. And I think for both of us, yeah. and I wish in hindsight, now that I look back at it, I wish somebody was there to tell us, hey, it's okay to take a year off for yourself. It's okay to let God first maybe just establish the home yeah. and then let God yeah, establish yeah. the ministry. I wish someone was there to say that to us at that point. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, of all the voices that we were surrounded with, no one really said that. People told us don't have kids, yeah. but nobody said don't do church planting and, and newly married life. Yeah. And what that first year did for us, because we didn't have the wisdom back then to do that, is you know how they say ministry doesn't hide things, marriage doesn't hide things. Mm -hmm. These things only amplify yeah. what's already existed yes. there in the shadows for a while. Right. And so when we got married, not only were we trying and learning how to do life together, we're trying to discover more of each other. We're trying yeah. to learn each other's habits, each other's personalities, each other's all that. While at the same time, we're trying to identify each other's leadership styles. <laughs> how do we make decisions? Yeah. Who makes the final call? Yeah. Which way do we go? Yeah. How do you want red? I want yellow. Yeah. Like, how do we, and even learning to identify each other's strengths That's in our good. calling That's good. so that we can actually start complementing yes. and not conflicting each other. That's the word. Try and do all those things at the same time yeah. in your first year of marriage is probably not the wisest thing. Nah. And so what ended up happening is because it's either going to, it's a pull, right? It's either you're going to water and invest in your marriage yeah. or you're going to water and invest in this ministry, which you're about to plant a church. <laughs> and so the natural pull, yeah. because we're both workaholics yeah. and because we're both so passionate about what God has called us to do, the natural pull in the first year became more towards let's nurture uh, and build the ministry. Yeah. And so a lot of things in the marriage started getting neglected. Yeah. Communication started getting neglected. Yeah. Quality time started getting neglected. Intimacy, all these things that are so vital in yeah. the first year of building a healthy marriage yeah. started getting neglected. Yeah. But because we were both thriving off of mm. the fulfillment of working together and getting things done, we didn't feel at first the lack Sheesh. of what was starting to miss and wow. what was starting to take us. Cause see, for this thing to succeed, this had to pay the sacrifice. Yeah. But we didn't realize at first yeah, that our marriage was paying the sacrifice <laughs> yeah. for the success of the ministry. Yeah. And so the first year anniversary went, and I just remember, I mean, in our first year, I could tell you, we argued about everything. Toothpaste, yeah. Yeah. church, yeah. decision. Yeah. We argued about everything. You, I didn't like the tone that you just said to take out this out of the microwave. What was that all about? Like everything <laughs> yeah. started happening. Yeah. Yeah. And um, eventually at the end of the first year, we came very quickly to the realization, hey, all of this could go away in a heartbeat, mm. but our vows to each other, yeah. we don't get to run away from that. We right. don't get to abandon that. Right. This doesn't get to go away until we're both in the presence of the Lord right. physically, yeah. like face to face, Literally. till death do us part. <laughs> yeah. And so if we want this to succeed, yeah. we got to start working on this because eventually the flaws and the things that are lacking here are going to start spilling outwards into what's going on there. And the last thing we want to do, we both seen this, the last thing we want to do is become another set of leaders who end up building successful ministries on the foundation of broken homes. Mm, Nobody wants that. Yeah. And so we said, all right, Lord, we took some time, we prayed, we we really just repented before the Lord for that because I really felt like the the grievance that we caused the most to wasn't to people, it was to God. Yeah. He's not asking you to sacrifice your marriage for the calling. In fact, your marriage Sheesh. is your first calling. Yeah. And if we can't successfully do that, we can't. If we, if me and you, if you can't lead me and if I can't yield and submit to you, yeah. we cannot lead these people. Right. So we got to get it right. And yeah. so right after that first year, we said, yep, we're getting into counseling. So we got into counseling. And man, that was such a blessing because it helped us to really start. 
we began understanding each other's differences in a way that no longer felt like we were against each other. That's good. And it was like, hey, we are really different people, but we are also people who really love each other. Yeah. And I love you and you love me and we picture a life with each other, none, no one else. Right. But we also have a lot of differences in our thinking, processing, delivering, mm. executing, that if we don't learn how to actually leverage that, that could be the very thing that pulls us apart. Right. And so we started doing counseling um, like every week uh, going into that second year. And then we started seeing the benefits of it yeah. that we actually kept it till now. Eight years later, we still it's part of our yeah. maintenance routine yeah. and we love it. But we had to fight a lot for our marriage in that first, I'd say the first three years for us, we had to really fight hard yeah. because the pull and the demands of ministry were really starting to impact the health of our marriage at right, home. Right, right. And we learned very quickly as well in that journey that, man, if we don't learn to submit to each other and submit to Christ, we can't expect people to submit to our leadership. Right. Oh, and we got to learn to model what we expect out of the people that we lead. We have to learn to model it at home ourselves, yeah. even when no one is watching. Right, right. And so the little things began to change the dynamic very fast. Yeah. But obviously, in hindsight, we realized, hey, we just had a really rough start because we prioritized something else that could have waited. Instead, we didn't. Um, and so through that process, we started growing a lot closer yeah. together. We Our friendship started to develop better um, and deepen stronger. Yeah, yeah. And with that, our working relationship changed. And then we had to learn to, and I'm going to say, I, I know I've been saying a lot, but... No, it's good. Um, we One of the biggest things that we had to work on is because we are in a unique situation where we are both pastors. You know, you see the dynamic of maybe a pastor and there's a pastor's wife, right. where she's more of like a support role and they're in the background, but not really like... In the like ministry. in the front, yeah, she's not on the front lines leading alongside and making decisions and preaching and teaching all those different things, right? Yeah. Our, our situation was a little unique because Paul and I are both on the front lines carrying like the burden of, of church, not just planting, but church pastoring. Right. And we had to figure out and learn very quickly how me and you are married, our roles are not married. <laughs> so we had to figure out a way to yeah. separate yeah. the pastoral relationship yeah. from the husband and wife relationship. Right, right. It's like, hey, there are times and spaces when me and you are going to operate as pastors yeah. and it's going to be our work hats on and we're going to look at each other as professionals who are trying to get this thing moving forward and yeah. trying to be faithful. But there's going to be spaces at home where we're not talking to each other from that from that angle. Right, You're right. my husband. I'm your wife. Right. And in this space, we're just a, a married couple. Yeah, yeah. And that was, I think, the hardest challenge of learning how to separate those two roles. Right. Me and you as pastors, me and you as husband and wife. Husband and wife. Yeah. And not letting not letting one, you know, um, spill into the other or vice versa. That's good, Christina. So he, here's what I would say. So I grew up in a house where so my mom wasn't a pastor but she was on staff at the church and was very much involved in the mm -hmm. ministry. And watching them, I always, I love my parents' relationship, it's beautiful, but I remember seeing how what happened in the church would always, spill. so they're talking about church-related things yeah. in the car, yeah. in the kitchen, on family vacations, yeah. and I'm like, do y'all ever get a break? <laughs> right. It's like, when does one end and the other begin? Right. And I remember my youth pastor, his wife is a nurse, mm -hmm. and, he would just tell me how he would go home and it'd just be peaceful because they don't got to talk about church. Right. They don't got to talk about ministry. Right. They can talk about other things. And I remember subconsciously <laughs> at a young age thinking to myself, like, I don't know if I want to be with someone in ministry because I just seen the difficulty of, yeah. and I love how you talked about <laughs> it is beautiful and it is something that we should celebrate. But I love how you're honest about how there, there's work there and the hardship behind that. And so even for me, like I've dated a couple of girls who've been like, it, wouldn't it be great? Like we could do ministry together and immediately like I'm triggered. Yeah. <laughs> it's a turn off, but I'm a pastor. So right. how do I say? How do you say it in a <laughs> way that's like not disheartening? Yeah. yeah like, yeah. no, nah, I don't really want you to min right, right, ministry. Right. Yeah. But uh, I wanted to ask you, because I think this is an important conversation to have. Like, what does it take mm. to know how to wear both hats and wear both hats well? Mm. so that you can honor each other and yeah. honor the call that God has for both of you guys. That's so good. I think the first thing that it takes is self-awareness. Yeah. I think there needs to be a healthy level of self-awareness to understand that I've been given different responsibilities and different roles, and I don't have to sacrifice one to make the other thrive. That's good. 
the real growth is learning how to be present in both of those spaces accordingly mm. and honor those spaces without causing one to be the sacrificial lamb for the other. Yeah. And I think it takes self-awareness to do that. And, yeah. and maybe a little bit more of like a, like a uh, personal example or like a yeah. tangible example would be, you know, um, we've had a long eight hour day. We've been in and out of meetings, church meetings. Somebody just left out on, no, you know, with no, with no warning. And, yeah. oh, my goodness, we don't have a team leader for this. And there's a lot right, of stress. Right. Right. And we carry that. We talk about that. We process that. Then we come home and we're sitting at a dinner table and like imagine the mood yeah. when you're trying to eat a meal in peace. And now your mind is going back to that same place yeah. that you've been in for eight hours prior to that, dwelling on who left, dwelling on what we still need, dwelling on what we still haven't done as a church, dwelling on what's still lacking. When in reality, in that moment, there's a person sitting across the table from you that just wants to connect to your heart. Yeah. And I think having self-awareness to say, hey, this moment, I need to show up for this person, not as their partner in work and yeah. in ministry. Yeah. I need to show up for this person as their support system, yeah. as their spouse. Yeah. But it takes self-awareness to recognize when those spaces are. Yeah. And now we've been married for eight years where even just by looking at Paul, I can identify when those moments are. It's good. Like I know when it's the moment to bring something up that's work related. Yeah. And I I know when I need to just leave it alone yeah. and not do that. Yeah, yeah. And he does the same. We now we've picked it up because we can read each other's body language. Right. We can pick up on certain things. Yeah. But it takes self awareness. I think that's the first thing. Self awareness. Um, and I think the second thing that it would take too is genuinely, man. I I think it's so important to pray for wisdom in your marriage. So good. Like I think we get married and there's there's certain prayers that we give up on or we forget once we get married because we feel like we've crossed the finish line and we're good. Yeah. But it's like no, you actually just started the race now. <laughs> so you need to app like you yeah, need to yeah, amp yeah. up on those prayers even more. Right, right. And I think one of those prayers is wisdom, like yeah. praying for wisdom, right? I love how James says it, right? That if you yeah. really seek for wisdom, you pray and ask for it and God will give it generously. He'll yeah. give it to you, right? Yeah. But I think we need to be consistent about the things we're asking for in our prayer. Right. And one of those things that we need to be asking for in prayer in marriage is for wisdom. Yeah. There are many moments in our marriage that God has, not by my own awareness or observation, but truly by the wisdom of God, things that God has revealed to me that I yeah. know yeah. has change the direction that a conversation was going, yeah. change the direction a decision was about to be yeah. made, not because of anything I picked up on, right. but in that moment, God just gives you divine wisdom to know how to approach your spouse yeah. and how to show up for your spouse versus how to show up for your ministry partner. Right, right. And so I think praying for wisdom, having self-awareness, and the last thing I would say how to get to that place is having honest communication with your spouse. Mm, yeah. um, we've been married for eight years, and as much as we know each other, one of the things I love that Paul still does is every week, at least three, four times a week, he'll ask me, hey, how can I best support you this week? Wow. What are some expectations you have of me this week that mm. I can meet? And it's like, a part of me is like, Wait, we've been married, you can't pick up the cues, right? <laughs> but a part of me is like, wow, thank you for still asking yeah. and not assuming. Right. And I think communicating with your spouse That's and so asking good. them, how, how do you need me to show up for you in this moment? Yeah. And what can I do to better support you? Yeah. How can I better serve you this week? What can I do to meet some of your needs? Yeah. And just having that communication to constantly give your spouse a sense of direction of which way to go and how to show up for you yeah. really helps to create a healthy separation right. between the working partnership mindset versus yeah. the married mindset. I love that. So, yeah. I love that. That's so good. I, I really like all three, but I'm thinking about the second one, praying for wisdom. I think so often people go to podcasts, people go to books, people go to sermons because they want a cookie cutter answer. Mm -hmm. They want, you know, I need to know specifically how to operate in this situation. Yeah. And what that does is it robs you of an opportunity to be dependent on the spirit of That's God. That's right. And there's some things that the Lord wants to teach you by staying near to him. That's right. And so when you're praying for wisdom, you're opening up yourself for him That's right. to actually guide your life. And it doesn't become legalistic That's right. or it's not a religion. It's That's actually, right. it's a relationship. It's alive. It's active. It's fresh. Yeah. It's, yeah. you know, and so I like that. Honestly, we can sit and talk for easily another hour, hour and a half. Yeah. We might have to do a part two because this yeah. was... There are so many things that was said that I want to pick apart and talk sure. about. And, and so, but thank you for your transparency, your vulnerability, for sharing your story. I wanted to end this conversation by asking the question, um, what is the number one thing? I'm sure it's many, but like if you can in this moment right now identify the one thing that you have learned mm -hmm. being married 
to someone you're in ministry with, mm -hmm. what would it be? Oh, that's good. One thing One that thing. I have learned about being married to someone in ministry. I know it's a lot. Um, I would just say, um, maybe the one important thing is guard or protect the love that you have mm. for the person that you married, not for the person that you do ministry with. Right. Yeah. So learn and guard that love that you have for the person that you married. Um, and I think I just, and I just say that because it's so easy without even realizing it to lose sight of that. Yeah. Um, and to neglect the one thing you're actually called to do with clarity, right, right, right. which is to really love and nurture yeah. and be present for the person God has blessed to you to do life right, with. Right. But you can forget that. You know, it's like when you're running like alongside of each other, building things, yeah, yeah. you're still doing it together. So you don't realize what on a heart level may have been neglected, right. but you realize, man, like, prioritize the love that you have for the person that you married more than the love that you have for what you get to do together. That's good. That's and so, so good. um, yeah, for anybody out there who's listening, who's married and who is married to someone in ministry yeah. or, you know, both of you guys are considering going into ministry, I would just say, protect the love that you have for each other more than the love that you have for what you guys are called to do together. And if you do that, I think you'll you will flourish. Beautiful. You'll flourish. <laughs> it's good. Uh, thank you so much for this conversation. This was fun. Yeah. We're going to have to have you come back again because mm -hmm. this is so good. I I was blessed. I was encouraged. And yeah. there is a few things I learned. So thank you for your wisdom, your yeah. time, and your vulnerability. It yeah. means the world. For I'm sure. sure people that are tuning in have been blessed as well. Let us know in the comment section what you thought. Make sure to hit the like button and the subscribe button. Until next time, family, peace and grace.